Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thanks, thanks, thanks for that introduction. Thanks for having me here. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Here's what I'd like to try to do is to talk um, some about basically what happened over the past year, year and a half. Um, this is back from the precipice. Uh, talk about a selected set of the, the policy initiatives that were involved in that process. And I'll try and spend some time talking about uh, uh, the, the future of, of financial regulation going forward as well. Just to give you a little perspective, um, this was a graph that people were fond of making, was kind of tracking the progress of this crisis relative to the Great Depression. As you can see, um, it's out around month 16 there, the brown line was below the green line. We were sort of tracking a bit ahead of the Great Depression's pace. One last thing I wanted to just draw your attention to, because I'll come back to it in kind of the policy discussion, is the market for asset-backed securities. If you look at the TAN line, you know, volume in this market is on the order in normal times, 40, 50 billion dollars a month. This went to absolute zero. This is just a very important part of what, what went wrong in, in markets. It's an important part of the fragility of the system. So I, I believe that, you know, one should, of course, do some of the things that are talked about in terms of strengthening bank capital. But I think one wants to do it in a symmetric way where we also look at how can we strengthen the infrastructure of some of these markets as well. Let me just talk briefly about some of the policy measures that were taken. There's this idea of a haircut, where a haircut is the down payment that you need to make, the minimum down payment that you need to make if you buy an asset-backed security and borrow against it. In a very, very short span of time around the Lehman Brothers episode, haircuts went from 5% to 50, 60, 100% in some cases. So the Fed steps in. The Fed basically offers to lend to new issues in certain categories. And if, if you look at sort of at the evidence for this, you know, this was not an enormous program, but it was, a, I would say, a modestly successful program. Short-term lesson is this market is fragile and we can do something to prop it up. Long-term lesson is, you know, what do we want to do next time around? Let me spend a little time talking about the stress test. Basically, the... Um, you know, the, the, the stress tests were designed uh, during the transition period between the Bush and the Obama administration. They were formally rolled out in February of 2009. So again, the idea was that the 19 largest bank holding companies were going to be examined. They were going to be given a number. This number was going to represent their need for capital, assuming an, quote, adverse economic scenario. They were going to be given a capital need. Then they were going to be told they had to raise that capital. They could either raise that capital in the private market or the government would stand behind as a backstop. So, you know, then along comes the, the results of the stress test. Um, the, the, the results as they were released said nine out of the 19 are basically okay as is. The other nine need a total of $75 billion. What happens in the wake of this, the market reacts very, very positively. Within the week, essentially, $60 billion of new common is raised by these banks, including I think the biggest one at the time was Bank of America. Bank of America, within the week, basically did a $13.5 billion equity um, raise. Since the period of the stress tests, more recently, there's been sort of further equity. I think we're over $100 billion of new private money that's gone into the banking sector. What was the success? You know, let me, let me entertain three hypotheses. One, one, one the kind of most, um, I don't know, simple and in some sense happy version of the story is to say these tests succeeded because they uncovered God's truth. In other words, we looked into the souls of the banks, we learned exactly what their problems were, we revealed this to the public, the public said, oh, problems are not so bad, that is the good news, the market rallies because the banks are in better shape than we thought they were. Here's another theory of why things went well. This is a slightly more, maybe it's a more cynical theory, maybe it's just a different theory. Maybe the numbers themselves weren't right. But the numbers are, in some sense, a statement about the government's intentions towards the banking sector. That is to say, if you say the number is $30 billion for Bank of America, that implies an upper bound, even in the worst case scenario, of how much equity the government's going to have to put into Bank of America. If you say $50 billion, you may be saying effectively, or if you say $100 billion, you're probably saying, I'm taking over Bank of America. Other smart things that the stress test did is normally we say to the banks, we want you to fix your capital ratio. In the middle of a systemic crisis, it would have not been good for us to tell the banking system, you know, you've got 100 billion, too little capital, fix the ratio. 
So what the stress test did, which was sort of different than the usual regulatory intervention, is they prescribed not a capital ratio. They didn't say, B of A, we think you're going to have a lot of losses, so we want you up to 12% now. They said, B of A, $33 billion. Okay? So we did not give them the option. We did not give them the option to delever to meet the thing. They had to meet a dollar equity requirement. You know, we could talk about the public-private investment programs, but again, this is how things work. This was something that a lot of hopes were pinned on. A lot of hopes were pinned on um, when we announced this. This was the first big success for the Geithner Treasury. The day that this was rolled out, stock market was up 7 or 8%. Um, ended up being a nothing. Ended up being a nothing. But I think, again, the, 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 um, the right interpretation is in a crisis, it makes sense to try a bunch of different things. And some of them worked. Some of them turned out to work less well. And you know, maybe if we had ro rolled history forward a, a different time, it would have, it would have uh, it would have come out a little bit differently. But you know, ex post, this, was not, this has, not played, uh, has not played an important role. Let me skip forward and say a few things about um, capital regulation. What I, I take to be the essence of a macroprudential approach is trying to have the, you know, the sort of prudential aspects of the capital and of the capital requirements, but without the kind of force for asset shrinkage that the conventional approach has. An, an individual bank acting completely rationally and in the interests of its shareholders will often prefer to shrink rather than to raise new capital. One reason for this is the, what's called the debt overhang problem. That is to say, if you're a bank and you're in distress and your preferred or your subordinated debt is trading at 60 cents on the dollar, if you raise new equity, much of the value of that equity issue is going to bolster the position of the lenders, because they're at the front of the line. So if you do a $10 billion equity issue, your, your creditors will say, thank you. Their things will appreciate from 60 cents to 80 cents. But equity, therefore, is losing something. So the private interests of equity are not the same as the public interest of stabilizing the balance sheets of the banks and of sort of averting fire sales. So that's how I think about capital um, macro prudential. And then um, you can ask yourself, well, if that's your broad perspective, what are some of the very concrete policies that you might have. So here I've just listed a few of the concrete things that get you in that direction. The first thing, I think something that has a lot to, to commend it, is the idea of time varying capital requirements. Another thing that gets talked about often in a quite uh, sort of amorphous way is the notion of quality of bank capital. Another thing that's gaining a lot of traction, at least in kind of uh, US circles, is contingent capital schemes. This is an idea that you know a year or two ago, was considered a little flaky. I think it's moving from flaky towards mainstream. Two more lessons and then I'll, I'll, I'll wrap up. One is I think, um, you know, we've been very focused in regulating capital. That is to say, very focused on regulating banks' mix between debt and equity. Much less focused on regulating the composition of their, cap of their debt. Now, an important element of this crisis and an important element of, I think, many financial crises is not just leverage per se, but it's the fact that financial institutions seem to be very drawn towards issuing short-term debt. And the last point I just want to emphasize is with all this emphasis on the banking system, with all this emphasis on the banking system, you got to remember a lot of the problems here originate outside the banks. There's a lot of assets, obviously toxic mortgages being just one example, that are held in common both by banks and the, by, by non-banks. And that if we put all this nice, good capital regulation and liquidity regulation too on the banking sector, guess what? You know, the world is going to want to find a way to do a lot of short-term repo financing against these securities. And if you just let that happen, it will happen outside the banking system. And then you'll have the fragility. It maybe it won't bring down a big bank, but it can it can well you know create a, an awful lot of havoc. So for the same reason that I believe in kind of capital and liquidity regulation, I would want to be thinking about analogs to that in the uh, in the securities markets. And I, just just to, to show you that it can be made concrete, not that this is necessarily the only way to go, but one concrete way to do this again would be asset-backed securities have essentially minimum margin requirements. That's something that, in principle, you could imagine a central bank, um, a central bank enforcing.